Welcome to class time, your daily classroom for CSEC and CAPE subjects. It's now time for information technology. I am Leo Lewis. Today, we're going to be focusing on information processing and forms. All right. So we, this was one of the possibly the, well, other than um, programming, this was one of the taboo subjects or taboo topics. And students tend to shy away from information processing. And I think mostly because they didn't understand the concepts behind it. So what we're going to try to do is to tie in information processing with the idea of creating forms in Google. All right? Of course, Google is not the only place you can create forms. Some of you who are doing um, IT at sixth form might be doing forms in HTML or something like that. But today we'll be looking at forms specifically. So what are forms? Well, essentially, they're just instruments for data capture. All right. Um, very early when computers just started coming into, into the fore, you would have possibly heard about the term data processing. But that has changed now to the idea of information processing. So a form or the purpose of a form is to gather information. So that information is like a, a large amount of data on this long sheet of paper. And so when you had this long sheet of paper to deal with, it would ha possibly have names, uh, dates, addresses, etc. Sort of like when you try to get your TRN or maybe when you were um, applying for sixth form or maybe you just got into high school and you had some forms to fill out. So that would be printed. And what would happen with that particular form is that you'd bring it back to the receptionist or whomever who would then do some kind of proofreading and look at the information, make sure that it's correct. And we need to look at that in information processing as well. But they'd look at it, see if it's correct, and then they'll hand it over to another secretary or what we call a data entry clerk. And the purpose of that person is just to enter the data into an information system. All right? That information system might, of course, have uh, a database on the back end of it. And then, of course, somebody would have possibly programmed an interface for that data clerk to interact with. And so that is how we tie forms in with information processing. So there were different types of forms. And the form that we had earlier when it was printed, or you might have gotten when, it, when you were applying, it was printed. We call it a source document. And the source document, of course, is created by a computer or something else. And you would write it up, or somebody else would write it up, hand it to the clerk, and that becomes a source of information. All right? Whenever a source document is created by a computer, and then has to be fed back directly into the computer. It's called a turnaround document. And that turnaround document you'll be acquainted with um, when you're working with OMR or OCR. You should have known those terms. Um, sorry, those terms. Um, OMR, optical mark reader. OCR, optical character reader. And that has to do with you doing multiple choice questions and, and, and the like. I think um, very, very early when, well, not, not our lot of scheme, but um, America's lotto scheme, you would have been given a sheet like this and you would have to fill out the numbers that you want and then that would be fed back into a computer and you would get back another sheet representing the information or representing the numbers that you've chosen. Of course, that has changed. So that's what we call a turnaround document, created by the computer to be fed back into a computer. Now, how you know the difference between these documents is that your turnaround document tends to have some markings either in the top margins or on a left margin or a right margin to signify to the scanner that, hey, this is how you read it. This is the top, this is the side, etc. And that now becomes a way for your scanner to recognize the document. All right? Um, so what is happening here with your clerk is that they get this information and they'll type it in. Now, a part of your syllabus might be that you'd have to um, think about or remember the jobs associated with information technology. Data entry clerk is possibly one of the lower level jobs where their purpose is simply just to enter information into an information system. They would, of course, understood what data is going where, and they had to have some special kind of skills. Now, those of you who are doing EDPM, do not disregard the skills that you get from EDPM. There are people today, well, the, 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 the fastest record of typing now is about 200 words per minute. Now, I don't know about you, but that is extremely fast. 
So if you want to be a data clerk or data clerk is on your mind, the idea is you have to have a very fast typing speed as well. But the entry clerk would enter this information, all right, and if they had a lot of these forms to process, then that's a lot of typing to do in whatever space of time. And that is why we as information technology professionals and of course managers, etc., had to be thinking about the idea of ergonomics. How can we make this workstation, this work area for this data clerk to be more health, well, health conscious, so to speak. So the idea of ergonomics is the science, it would, we would say, of making an environment human conducive. So you'll find that if it wasn't, that wasn't the case, you'll find out that these clerks would end up with carpal tunnel um, and then computer vision syndrome, um, you know, all kind of different injuries. And so, of course, we had to study and find ways to make the environment better for them. But they had to enter this information. But here, what, here's where the problem comes in. First, the human fills out the information on the form gives it to a receptionist who is another human who has to now check the form and hand it over again now to a data clerk who is another human who has to make the entry. And information processing and the steps regarding verification and validation of data became important because we had the human elements in it and we know that we are humans and humans will err. And so a human takes the information and has to verify it. And these verification techniques have to take place so that the data going in is correct. And the validation techniques have to take place so that the data going in matches what the computer understands. So those errors would occur. Who else? A database administrator is a person who basically designs your database and develops the different tables, queries, etc. behind this whole data information processing, or information processing, I should say. And so, as the data is coming in, the database administrator is the one who designed the database so that each piece coming in would match the fields in the database. And if they didn't pass a certain criteria and a certain standard, good, sometimes it would not be stored. And so your database administrator has to, had, has to be supporting the information processing um, process as it goes through. And so he has to ensure also that the database, um, or sorry, the data entry clerk can of course make sense of the interface. And then we have the programmers, and normally the programmers are the ones who are creating the software or who are putting in the validation and the verification um, code so that your forms can make sense and so that the data entry process can be pretty easy. So your form essentially then is a point of information or getting information from a user. And that part of the process can be filled with errors. And we try our best to remove the errors there. For example, a lot of us have different kinds of, our, our, our names are written in different ways and uh, have different um, special characters associated with them. And sometimes we as human beings don't understand or understand that kind of arrangement. And so the process of verifying your data is important. All right, um, it, 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 it can't be said any, any clearer than that, I guess. So we now want to move away from paper and create what are called electronic forms. And these electronic forms can be created in Microsoft Word, Google Forms, or HTML code. There are a ton of other places or other places on the web that you can um, get forms from. I, I know that there are like SurveyMonkey and some of these that give you some standard forms to work with or, or give you some templates to work with. But for all purposes at the CSEC level and possibly at the CAP level is that you should be able to create forms using Microsoft Word and Google Forms and HTML code. If you are not quite sure about how to do it in Microsoft Word. You can see the information or you can watch Schools Not Out on TVJ's website. There is a, a pretty basic introduction to Microsoft Word and the creating of forms on that particular 
web page or website. All right, but today we should be looking at Google Forms and how we can create forms in Google Forms. <clears throat> All right, so let's just look at the controls real quickly. Some of them you are already acquainted with. Um, the image that you're seeing to your right is of the form controls that comes from Microsoft Word, that comes from the developer ribbon. Uh, but I'm showing you it here so you can see that there are controls there that you might be acquainted with. We're seeing checkboxes, um, we're seeing some frames, we're seeing drop down, um, drop down lists, um, radio buttons, text, etc. Uh, they, according to your syllabus, your syllabus only provides you with about five of them. Um, each of them are, have some relevance and we're going to look at them. So we have check boxes, we have text boxes, data pickers, drop down list, command buttons. According to your syllabus, you are going to be marked in your SBA for at least three of these. And um, at least three meaning of course, of course three that are sensible. So you can't just throw in controls because you need them in there. If they make sense, for the particular form and for the information that's coming in, then fine, we're good. But if they don't make sense, you won't be getting the grades for them. And then you'll be marked essentially for the layout of your form. And if you're creating it in Word, you have to create it in a way that makes it seamless for a user to use. And so you might want to think about creating a table and placing the controls in the table. As for Google, however, you are already given a structured layout. So part of it is done for you already. Um, so you can find that information from, um, I think it's on page six of your syllabus. Um, so please check it. Uh, so what are the controls? The first one we look at is check, check boxes. And you know this one because it's square, essentially. It's a square. Um, the convention for these is that you'll find that when you click on them, a tick appears, all right? Um, and it allows for more than one selection. So maybe you'll have, let's say, a question that a person needs to select two or three answers. Then you want to say, hey, we have these amount of options. You can select one or two or more, depending on your answer, all right? And we call it close-ended. Why? Because you are already given the options to select from. So those of you who are doing questionnaires at CAPE, or right, keep mostly, you want to think about your questionnaires uh, in terms of close-ended, open-ended, and check boxes make sense for close-ended um, questions, especially when you have more than one option. Then we have our radio buttons, and these only allow for one option or one selection in a group, all right? So if you have a group like male, female, then you can only choose male or female. So as long as you have one group, then you can only select one choice. Um, if we did this, well, from a hard copy perspective where the forms were physical and you had paper, you would have to tell the user or tell the person filling out the form, only choose one, all right? In the case of Google Forms or in the case of Microsoft Word, and HTML. You don't necessarily have to say that to your user or to the person filling out the form. The control already is created with that kind of mechanism that allows you to only select one. So that is handled already. So there goes the removal of one kind of verification, all right, to check, to see if the correct thing is ticked or, or if they ticked both. So instead of the human being responsible for checking if one is ticked and not two, the computer has already handled that kind of a selection. Um, you will notice that it's acquainted with multiple choice questions. So for those of you who might have done the CXC examination on, online, you would see this kind of a setup. And of course, again, it is close-ended, meaning simply the options are there, you have to choose one. Then the other option, text boxes. Now the text box are a little bit more um, flexible. I should say. So the entries for the text box can be a barrage of text. Special characters also are allowed, numbers, all right? And here is the key to verification and validation. Whenever you have an open-ended kind of entry or kind of question or kind of 
answer to make, the more verification and validation is needed. Let me repeat. If an answer is omended in the case of using a text box for the answer, more verification and validation is needed. For example, maybe your form says, please enter your age. The possibility exists that somebody will enter text instead of numbers. The possibility exists that a person will enter an age of 300. And so because it allows for those kinds of errors or those kinds of entries, you have to be more vigilant with an open-ended kind of control and make sure that you test for those things going forward. All right, so your text boxes, because of the open-endedness, we need to check them for data type. So if, you're, if a person is supposed to enter a number, then we need to check if they've entered a number or if what they've entered is text, all right? A range, we might, depending on age, or if, let's say we're looking at age, we might want somebody to enter a particular range of ages. So for example, you might be registering to vote, and even though you want date of birth, maybe somebody might put something in there for you to enter your age. And then we would have to check, okay, is this person older than 18 or 18 or older? That's a range. If you are younger than 18, then you would, your application to vote will be rejected. Length, all right? Um, <laughs> this, is, this one is funny, but in most databases, there is a, there is a limit. Um, I think it's about 255 for access uh, for the amount of characters that you can place in a text. So with your text boxes, sometimes you are able to go even further. Um, like, let's say for instance, you know, we want to put a very long name there. Um, you would have to specify how long you want that name to be. There are some, some people with very long names, and then there are some places very long name, with, with very long names. Um, well, we, we from Clarendon know, give me a bit, that's not very long. Um, I don't know if one of the cameramans could, cameramen could possibly tell me, you know, a long name for a place. Uh, but we know of long names. I tell you, there is one particular uh, place, I think it's in, in Wales, where, where the name is about a hundred, the name of the town, maybe about 200 characters. Um, I, I hope I can remember it. Yeah, um, yes. The name of the place is <clears throat> Clan Fire Puth Green Gwith Goge Quen Trobo Clan Titi Silo Go Go Go. That's the name of the place. And I'm thinking to myself, how is that the name of a place? But you want to ensure that the name or the characters allow for a long or, 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 or restrict the, the entries. So for a name like Clan Farp, you know, etc., you would want to have possibly 250 or 300. Um, I don't think access goes beyond 250, though, for some kinds of text. Uh, but in a text box, you can make that restriction if necessary. Then we have presence checks and format checks. A presence check is simply just checking the, hey, does, is a value in this particular box, all right? And if there is a value, then, you know, we can go on depending on what we have there. And then format. Sometimes you might need to specify the kind of or, or the different characters you want a person to enter. For example, if they're supposed to enter an ID number, you want to specify what those characters are and the correct format for those entries. For example, if you went to possibly um, in, inland revenue and you were asked for your TRN, the person who is going to be enter, entering your TRN to find out your information might have a format to enter and if they try to enter anything else, it would not work or the entry would not go through. Um, and so we have to have proofreading and double entry and let me just talk about double entry for a minute. The double entry has to do with you entering the value twice. For example, when you entered your email address or when you tried to to enter your password for your email address. Oftentimes, you'd be asked, hey, okay, enter it once, enter it a second time, and then what the, what the program would do is to compare both values to see if they match. And if they match, the assumption is you knew what you entered, you're aware what is, of what is there, and of course, you're good to go for your password. 
all right? Then we have a data picker, um, which also uh, alleviates some other stress. Instead of you possibly entering a, a, an age, what you'd enter or what you'd select essentially is a date from this date picker, all right? It should be date picker. So date picker, you simply just click on a particular date, which more or less um, resembles the date that you want to enter. So if it's a date of birth, uh, if, it's, if it's possibly, um, well, not date of death, but date of marriage, date of, um, date of registration, stuff like that. Um, and this also allows for, or this needs a range and presence check most often than not, depending on what you want to do. Uh, command button. Uh, well, a command button essentially just runs an action. There isn't, you have to know it, yes, but for your SBA specifically, there might not be a need for it. But if you want to play around with it, that's a good idea to, 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 to do. The most common ones are the reset and submit button. And again, you might see this when you're, when you're online or trying to enter some information relating to possibly email, you'll have the, the opportunity to reset the, reset the entire form. So when you click on reset, every control, text box, data pick, date picker, uh, radio button, check, all of those go blank or go back to a default. That's what your reset does. So you can fill out the form again. Um, this control in HTML does that very same thing, but it's programmed in for you. So the, 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 the browser already knows what it's supposed to do, all right? Your submit button, of course, sends the form wherever it's supposed to go. When, we, when you're working with HTML, well, even though I'm going into, six, in, into sixth form IT or keep IT, one of the things that you have to remember is that this submit button, depending on a kind of action, will put the information that you have in the form inside the URL, all right? And most of the times you'll be told, do not do that or do not allow for that kind of an action. If there are, there's information in the form, which can be sensitive information, you want to ensure that that is hidden from your browser URL and from anybody else who could be snooping. All right? Now, maybe you're at home, you're listening on the radio, you're watching the television, and you don't have internet access. If that is the case, then eventually you will need to create the form electronically. But what I would like to encourage you to do is to review your SBA first and foremost and identify the purpose of the form. If you have your SBA already, chances are you already know what the form is supposed to do. So when you have figured that out, you want to pay attention now to what information do I need to get? And then that information will tell me what controls I need to use. And when you've identified these things, you begin to write them down. Just jot them down and make sure that you understand what you should have for your form. So for example, you might need to have a first name in your SBA form. It would make sense for you just to jot down, okay, the data item I need is first name. The data type is definitely going to be a text. The control text box, and maybe you'd want to put down what kind of validation you, you are thinking of using. This can help you so that when you actually get the chance to create the form, you already have this documentation and you'll just sit and complete it easier. All right? So make sure if you don't have a computer at home or you, know, you just don't have any internet, um, you, you might only be listening by radio and there's possibly no way in this particular season that you can get to do it online or do it on a computer. It makes sense for you just to write down these things that you intend to do. And a step further, you could go ahead and sketch how you want your form to look. Now, of course, it seems like you're going backwards to doing pencil and paper or using pencil and, pencils and papers, but it makes more sense to have that kind of a kind of a regimen going for you so that when you finally sit in front of the computer, you already know what to do and you don't have to worry about 
all the other things relating to what you don't know or what you don't have. All right? So get this going. Even if you have a computer, I advise you just to sit down and do some drawing yourself or sketching and to see how you want your form to look. All right? <clears throat> so we're going to try an example, but a, a very, very small example, if we have the time. If we have the time. <laughs> um, so let's say, for instance, my project is that I want, um, want people to join my youth group, all right? my church youth group. And what are my needs for that church youth group? Well, essentially, I might be needing personal information, per, um, information like you know, the regular things, name, um, possibly address, phone numbers, or cell phone number, email address. Those kinds of personal information is what I might need. And then I might need talents and gifts. You know, what can you do? How can you now contribute to the youth group? So um, quick tips, uh, quickly, again, Coming back from your exam or from your SBA, uh, you'll be marked for at least three controls. So this is inside your SBA. This is inside your syllabus, all right? So three points for three or more controls and two marks or two points for your layout, all right? Again, Google tends to give you a standard layout. So you are halfway there where you might lose the mark for a layout if you're using a Google form, if you, if you just throw the controls all over the place with no particular order or, or, or sense in, in, in the order, all right? So you will be getting that kind of mark or that form layout mark. Um, you might not need to think about validation right now. Uh, essentially, it's, it, it would take some time for you to understand that. So. Um, so the validation can be left until another time. Um, possibly when you're, when you're doing it in six form. Okay. So when you start using, when you start Google or your own Google Forms, you'll get something like this, an untitled form, which basically asks you now to title it. So you, I could put my church group, etc., cetera, et cetera, um, or the name of it, so that anybody who comes in and sees the form will see the name of the youth group, etc. And you'll get a blank question to start with, just at the bottom. Um, so you'll see untitled question, and its default is multiple choice, and then there are a couple of options. All right? So this is how your Google form would initially look. And as long as you have a Gmail account, you can go straight to Google Drive and click on New, click on Forms. And that will open a brand new form called enti un Untitled. Sorry. And then you'll just change that untitled form to the name you want. All right? And then, just let's, let's just look at um, the different choices that we have here. Again, you are allowed three or more controls, and we've looked at what, four of them already. Uh, short answer is like text. And so that short answer and would, would allow you some text entries, inclusive of numbers and special characters, as well as paragraph. So for those of you who might um, want to put mathematical calculations there, you might have a little bit of a challenge. Uh, then we have multiple choice checkboxes and drop down, and drop down is the one, that, the one that we didn't talk about before, but we'll be looking at it later. And then we have date. But in this case, or in the case of Google, and sometimes with Microsoft Word, you can, you can add a time as well. So date and time tends to come together. All right? All right, so the text box for your Google form would look like, a, it, it, it's normally very plain. Um, so you'd have a, a place to put the first name. So here, persons who want to join my church would possibly put in their first name. And then the selection would be short answer and that allows now for a text entry to go in now there is one other thing that we 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 noticing here we have this button or this switch called required and this button or switch called required simply allows or forces the user or those entering the form to enter something here so if nothing is entered here the form will not be submitted so this has to be entered that is why we have that required there and if we check um check through that again we can see where we can add a validation and this one is saying number number is greater than no if 
we don't want the person to enter a number. We must ensure that if we're putting, putting in any validation, we must ensure that it's a check for text. All right? So play around with that, and of course, you will get good at it. When we look at the first name, we can see where the validation comes in as well. Uh, we have four different forms of validation, number, text, length, regular expression. Uh, well, as you can see, we spoke about a couple of them already. Text allows for, more or less, tests for any kind of text that we should put into our for, in for first name. But what, there's one particular one that might give you a little bit of a problem, but you don't need to use it again. Regular expression. Now, what Google allows you to do is to create a regular expression that maps to what you exactly want the person to enter. And that is where we spoke about validation as it relates to format, right? We have a particular format we want the person to enter, and we want to restrict them to that format. The regular expression in Google allows you now to create a set of characters or create a, an expression that mimics the set of characters that you expect to, in, to expect the user to enter. Again, you don't need to know about or need to know how to use it for your SBA, good? But you can have that as, as an example when you get a question on your exam about validation and verification, all right? All right, um, so that is how our text looks. Let's jump on to radar buttons quickly, or option boxes. As we said before, it's just like a multiple choice, and whenever you create something like this, you would definitely select multiple choice from Google, and then you would have to enter the options that you want with, with your multiple choice. In this case, we're working with gender. So we have male and female here. Um, and this male and female, uh, of course, can be deleted. We have our X's at the, at the right hand side so that we can delete whatever entries we want. So maybe you're not asking for male and female, maybe you're asking for something else. You can change the options as is necessary. And so here we see an example of one being selected. And again, here we select female or we've selected female, which means basically we can't be both male and female. So we've selected female. So the person who's entering can't select both male and female. Thank God for that. Um, uh, so, so that's the option choice, all right? And then we have check boxes, which allow for several different entries. And of course, we wouldn't want to put gender here. But anyway, the ta this, real, this one is collecting the talents of the particular person. And all I did was to type talents, change the option to text box on the far right. And then I've entered for my options, plays music, prayer warrior, sports person. All right, and again, we also can remove them by clicking on the X. There is a little option there as well that looks like a little mountain to the right hand corner, which allows you to enter or which allows you to put a picture there as well. And so Google allows for that kind of a control or the, that, kind of, um, that kind of sprinkling on your form to make it a little bit different, all right? <clears throat> and here we see where we've answered or make some entries in our checkboxes. So we've selected plays music, prayer warrior. And those two selections are right where we want it. Good. And as you notice, even if you wanted to select sports person, we could. Because your option or these options are all available when you're working with checkboxes. All right. Your date picker. Of course, we, look at, we, we want date of birth, and so your date picker looks a little bit different. All it allows you for, or allows for you, sorry, is that you will just select a particular date and time. And that date and time, or in this case, we don't have any time, but you can add the date and time. That date comes from a drop down or something like a drop down that shows your current date, etc. And you can go back and forth between year, um, between months, all right, to select the date that you want. Um, in this case, or let me just move on because I, I, my floor manager, so we're running out of time. Um, so we have a drop down list, and just like your, just like your radio button, just like your other stuff, um, you want to put in the, or just like your option box or your radio button, you want to put in the options. All right. 
put in your options. And in this case, again, we have male and female. We're just playing with it. And the X's are there that we can remove, etc., etc. But with your drop down box, instead of selecting a radio button, you would have to select from a drop down. And it just basically poof, drops to the bottom of the selection. So we have female, male being dropped right at the bottom of our, um, of our selection. And again, you don't need to validate this because this is closed ended. So you can just create a drop down and the, the user will have to put in what, whatever they need. All right? Well, that is all. I'm sorry we couldn't spend more time together. Um, but, you know, we have some more, some more things coming up. Um, that's all for CXC Information Technology. We have biology coming up next. Soon forward. Interactive classes for all ages on the School Time channel on OneSpotMedia.com. With a combination of live Zoom classes and recorded class time, schools not out lessons, and numerous educational content, we've created a comprehensive 24-hour channel dedicated exclusively to educating our nation's youth. Early childhood through to primary, secondary and tertiary, it's one stop on one spot for education, 24 hours. Brought to you by the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information in association with Television Jamaica Limited.